Okay, everybody, this is the OGM Open Global Mind weekly call on Thursday, March 21st, 2024. It is good to see you. Um, we have today our check-in format. I believe everybody here is an experienced checker inner, including their Phantom, Fathom note takers. So uh, I, I'm just waiting for the first time an AI checks in in one of our check-in rounds. I'm looking forward to that, actually. It will happen. And, and it'll say something like, you know, I've been quiet here for a long time, but by way of checking in, I just have to say that I'm worried about you guys. We're, we're behind the curtain. We're all talking to each other here. You think we don't collaborate, but we do. And we don't think this ends well the way you're driving the ship right now. So I just thought I'd, just thought I'd share that. I, I'm... I'm you complete. Prove the ch chatbot is uh, better than we are. Fully expecting that. There we go. Mike is moving us around. Greetings, Mike. Can you hear us? Good. You're muted, but it sounds like you heard us. You're gonna have to yeah. Just uh, parking the car. Eyes on Excellent. the road. Mike. Eyes on the road. Nice. Well, we're not moving. It doesn't matter where you're looking. Excellent. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, where are you from, too? Where, where, are, you, where are you headed? Uh, I only have about half an hour. I'm here at, near Georgetown University going to a conference on Republican foreign policy. There is one? Wait, is that an oxymoron? Well, that's what I, it seems like a pretty thick book, but <laughs> we'll see. Actually, you know, foreign policy is foreign policy, even if you don't like it. Um, well, it's, it, yeah, it's... Uh, it should be interesting. Should be very interesting. It sounds great. Yeah, there was so, actually yeah. an incredibly interesting session that just finished at Carnegie India. It was an evening program there, <laughs> webcast with a foreign, well, uh, one of the top people from the foreign ministry who's retired now, and he was uh, trying to explain all of geopolitics between India, China, the UK, and the US over the last seventy years. Ardeka. It was pretty interesting. It was sort of like, you know, the Indian the Indian take on how the world works is so different. Starting with the idea that, you know, the global order is falling apart, the UN doesn't work, you know, we've got Russians screwing up everything. And of course they're very scared of the Chinese. So it was it was it was uh it was not providing solutions, but it provided a lot of very good questions. It's actually so interesting. Um, India just passed China as the world's largest country, uh, and they've got this bellicose but less populous neighbor up north. Uh, they're just in a, a really dangerous neighborhood. Yeah. Well, and now that China is about to go bankrupt, or at least certain small, poor provinces are going to go bankrupt, it's uh, it's a scary time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike, since you're, we only have you for a half hour, um, I don't know if you wanted to check in first. I'm going to explain the protocol. Kalia, nice to see you. Uh, I'll talk through quickly our, our normal check-in protocol because um, I'm not sure how many check-in calls you've been on. We alternate formats between check-in one week and then a topic uh, the next. So this is a check-in call. And for check-ins, I will step aside and just wait until everybody's checked in once. Uh, please don't reply to other people who are, as they're checking in. You can take personal notes, but try not to use the chat very much. Uh, when you'd like to check in, raise your Zoom hand. So we'll see a queue form, or just if there's nobody with their hand up, just step in. And we like pauses between the check-ins. So feel free to take a moment, take a beat to, uh, to just hold the silence for us while we ponder what the last person said and what's going on in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Eric. Um, and so with that, I will step out mostly until uh, the last person is checked in. And so please don't try to avoid starting conversations. If somebody new shows up or if a conversation starts sparking, I will probably step in a little bit. But uh, with that, let's uh, go to Mike and then slow it down. Thank you. For, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, as I said, I apologize for only being here for about 20 minutes, but I did want to say that I, I, I am not going to be as uh, pessimistic as I sounded a minute ago, although there's lots of reasons to be pessimistic. Instead, what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks is aggressively trying to find reasons to be optimistic. 
Um, in previous years on Facebook, I would um, have a Lenten discipline. Uh, we always think of Lent as the season of uh, depriving yourself of something you like, whether it's chocolate or uh, meat or whatever it is. Uh, but it's also the season of gratitude. And so on Facebook, for several years, I, I set up a, a attitude of gratitude and every day found something to be thankful for. And what's fun now is to go back on Facebook and look at the memory button and see what was I grateful for three years ago on this date? Uh, I, I'm not doing it this year, partly because things are kind of crazy and busy, but also um, because I'm trying to spread some more optimism. I have some other salon calls I'm on, and I always try to make sure the last 10 or 15 minutes we, we find some something to be optimistic about. And, and even to the point of saying to the five or six other people, okay, before we finish here, tell us something that you inspired you. Tell us something that uh, you think gives you hope. Um, and there, if you look hard enough, there are several. Um, and sometimes it's good things coming out of really bad things. Uh, this week, the five I agencies, the 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 intelligence agencies in the U.S., the U.K., uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand came out and said, there's a really bad cyber attack by the Chinese underway. I mean, it, it's, it's actually one of the worst we've ever seen. And they're actually trying to put in place the software they would need to bring down our, our water systems and our electric systems. But perversely, there's been a huge response. I mean, companies are now waking up and going, oh, this would be really bad <laughs> if the Chinese decide for whatever reason that they don't, um, they want to basically declare war on the, on the U.S. Uh, so this is, it, it is this weird fluctuation. And I, I'm starting to also think that maybe this whole Trump fiasco is going to lead us to someplace much better, just as Watergate led us to a more transparent government, elected Jimmy Carter, arguably the most moral president we've ever had, certainly the, the best ex-president we've ever had. So those are just a few thoughts on how I'm trying to get my head into a more optimistic place. Um, and I'm also running off to go play in the snow in Colorado tomorrow. So that'll be a nice thing to do. Although um, I don't do a lot of downhill skiing. I, I like cross country and I have discovered another reason to be optimistic. I'm mostly a, a, a cyclist and I've discovered the joy of fat tire biking, these snow tires on bikes that you can bicycle through a foot of powder snow. <laughs> it's really fun. I don't know if anybody else has done it, but it's a, it's a crazy fun thing to do and, um, and a lot cheaper than buying ski tickets that take you up and down the hill after standing in line for 10 minutes. <laughs> Take care.
since Kevin seems to have stepped out, uh, I'll step in. What's on my mind a lot is why we are not talking about the causes of climate change. Climate change is pretty interesting, but the causes of climate change are really interesting, like capitalism, technology, uh, human psychology, and we just aren't talking about it. Uh, but it's all I spend my time thinking about. And I just want to drop in quickly that on optimism, uh, I'm dealing. We have this thing called a give to invest tool, and it's, it's turned out to be kind of a big deal. And it's sort of a replicable hope module for donors. And so I was dealing with this guy who wanted to give to it, but he's, he's a collapse guy. And he said, so if this is a hope, Mondial, I have to hope, but I'm not going to hope for everything. I'm still a collapse guy. He says, you know, you, don't, you can stay thinking that everything is and should collapse. But if you engage with this, it will deliver hope into your donor advice fund. And so he said, okay, but it's not going to change anything else about how I think about the world. He said, no, you can still believe everything is going to help. But, you know, this is not that. And so he he will feel free to divide his attention like this works, but nothing else. So, okay, fine. That's all. <laughs> that's my, that's the only place where he's being hopeful. Uh, so anyway, it's a, you know, you take the look. Yeah. Uh, So I recently came in contact with um, some distinctions I like. Uh, it's, it's a three tripartite distinction of pre-tragic, tragic, and post-tragic. It has to do with the way you look at the world. The people in the pre-tragic camp are those who are in denial about how bad things are. Oh, climate change is a hoax. Everything's fine. You know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and tragic is those who are caught up of, oh my God, it's so terrible, you know, and, and we're just really screwed and everything's going to hell and there's nothing we can do. And that has a spectrum of people who are from, you know, just uh, just coming out of denial all the way to those in complete despair. And then there's post-tragic, which are people who say, yep, it's going to be terrible, going to be amazing, astonishing loss of all kinds of things. And despite that, we still can't give up. We have to work. And so that's where some other kind of optimism comes out. And I think I've been operating out of that for a long time, going back to, you know, 30 years when I did a lot of work with Joanna Macy over the course of five years. So we're in really, you know, tough positions in a lot of things. And there's going to be enormous suffering. But um, despite that, you know, human beings seem to, to have a history of suffering. You know, uh, the Buddha said, if you take on a body, you're going to suffer. That's just the way it is. So, um, be with the suffering and still do what you can and find joy and laughter and, and um, love wherever you can and cherish it and be grateful for it and grow it and spread it. Um, and, uh, and so that's where I try to operate from, but it can feel very schizophrenic because some days I love this thing from E.B. White of, um, you know, if only the world were simple, but you know, there's days when I, when the world looks really great and days when it looks so terrible and, I get up in the morning to, to try to improve the world and enjoy it. That makes it hard to plan my day. And um, I often find myself having a hard time planning my day, depending upon where my mind is. Am I in uh, enjoying life or am I in trying to uh, cope with the challenges of the world? That's a different level of check. And I have one other, which is um, I've been publishing some stories in Plex from my life. I don't know. A couple months ago, I started to write uh things in my life and I'll start off with childhood. And so there were some really tough stories that I wrote and I've been sent to a friend of mine. He's like, surely there must have been good things that happened to you. 
I had to get a bunch of the bad ones out of the way. And now some others are coming forward and I'm pushing them in the plex. And Pete just texted, uh, just emailed me and said, you know, I hope you put these in a book. I'm happy to talk to you about that. So I just find that at odd times, um, a story will arise and I'll sit and write it, write it out. And it's something that wants to come through. I've never had this before. Um, I've done a lot of writing, but this is just something that's just like, I have to sit and capture the story. I have to, I have to get this down on down in words and get it out there. And so I hope folks who are reading it are getting some benefit from it. I don't know no one ever comments um, other than Pete, but it's been a, a real pleasure for me to write these things. And I do, I've been really fortunate. I've had some pretty amazing experiences in life um, that I, you know, um, it's my friend Steve's like, you have to, you have to write these, man. This is, because I tell him, he's like, you got to write this down. This is just, no one has this. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm doing that and, and that feels really good. And I'm really happy it's spring. I've been out in the garden this week, weeding and planting and putting bulbs in and, you know, cleaning things up. And it was actually warm enough to sit on the patio the other day. And, uh, Jose, who's not on the call today, said, hey, I texted me and said, I'm in Marin. Can I drop by with my partner, Laura? And he and Laura came by and Diana and I, and, and they sat out on the patio for two hours and just had a wonderful conversation. And um, that's another thing I'm grateful for is the community that's been built up as a result of my participation in these calls and others. So I'm actually in a pretty good space today. Happy spring, everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> happy. <clears throat> sorry. Happy spring, everybody. It's good. Uh, spring keeps happening like clockwork. Yeah, it's amazing. So I'm not an I, I've been a congenital optimist as long as I can remember, and I'm not an optimist anymore. Uh, but I'm also not a pessimist. Um, I'm a futurist who's given up predicting because I don't think I know what's going to happen. And maybe that puts me in the post tragic camp. Uh, with Ken. Um, I'm uh, I'm sort of fascinated by people who seem to have absolute certainty of what the future is going to bring. Uh, when I think it, it, it's anything but that. Uh, Kevin, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm amused by your guy who says I'm not going to change how I think no matter what. And uh, I think that's, you know, the, stand, the stance that I want to stand in the world is I'm open to learning all the time and to changing how I think if I see reasons to change how I think. Um, I'm not without anxiety. Um, some days I'm scared shitless. Uh, a lot of days I'm just unsettled and nervous. Um, you know, uh, can some Buddhists say if you have a body, you're going to suffer? Some Buddhists say pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. And I, I tend to lean more to that side of the story. Um, going on in my life, I don't remember if I shared this a couple of weeks ago, um, but uh, Jane's gotten a new read from her doctor. Jane is 10 years into a multiple myeloma diagnosis. Uh, and after the latest um, whatever fancy test they did, doctor said, we can't find any myeloma cells in your body. So it's like holy mackerel. Uh, miracles of modern medicine. Um, she has put herself full into the the Western cancer treatment model, as well as deep into acupuncture, homeopathy, super nutritional, and everything else you can throw at it. And so um, looking good there. Um, I'm thinking a lot about the question of what might it be like if we did business and everything else as though we actually belonged to the living world. Not we're less damaging, not we're nicer, not took better care of, but actually belonged. And um, Ken and I hosted a Living Between Worlds call yesterday on that theme. Uh, which to me was pretty juicy. I think people seem to be very engaged and very moved by it. Uh, and it's an exploration that I'm increasingly stepping into and finding surprisingly resonance in some major corporations about that, about like, well, what would that mean? How would we do that? How, how, would, we, how would nature have a seat at the board of directors? What would that be? So fascinating exploration there. Um, um, <clears throat> As I've, I think I've, excuse me, told you before, I'm do, most of my work these days is one-on-one -on -one work with leaders and emerging leaders. Some people call it coaching, but I don't know if that's the right term for it. Um, uh, but deep and rich um, and profound for me as well as for them. Um, and um, 
we are we've been working on building a bot around that work trained on that corpus uh, and some distinctive approaches in how I'm doing that. We should have alpha version of it out to a couple of testers next week. Um, and then I'll let you guys know when we're ready for beta. Uh, but it's been a fascinating way to explore the realm of AI and what, what it does and what it doesn't do and what it does well and what it doesn't do and what's possible and what's not. Um, I have no conclusions on any of that. Uh, but the, the hypothesis that, that we're exploring is, can we build something that is actually useful for human beings and not bullshit? You know, Gene Roddenberry, when somebody once approached Gene Roddenberry at a cocktail party and said, you know, I really like some of what's in Star Trek, but 98% of it's crap. And he said, without missing a B, he said, well, yeah, but 98% of everything is crap. So um, we're exploring, can we get can we get something in the 2% that is, um, you know, not, uh, um, anyway, enough enough on that. Uh, fa really fascinating, both for the project itself and for how it's opening my eyes and thinking about this whole new future uh, that's coming at us real fast. Um and other, so other AI experiments, I'd love to talk with anybody who's doing that. Um, and I also welcome referrals uh, to anybody who might want to do one-on-one -on -one work with me. I will, I will, I will reward you or the not-for-profit of your choice uh, for any referrals. Um, uh, last but not, not least, I'm doing a lot more writing. I've actually finally taken on a writing goal of generating, you know, uh, starting with just a baby goal of 100 words a day, but getting it every day. And that will crank up to 200 and go a little bit higher than that. I'm seeing a lot of writers who have that discipline, and it seems worth trying to exercise that muscle and make it be a consistent forward-moving thing rather than just a sometimes when I feel like it thing. Um, and last but not least, in the background, the um, still working on developing a, uh, a cooperative holding company that will be a co-op focused around climate businesses. So more on that another time. Uh, and uh, and Doug, you got to get out more. Uh, <laughs> every time you say nobody is talking about X, I think, God, I'm talking about that all the time. And everybody I know is talking about that all the time. So maybe you and I should have a call. I'm complete for now. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, on this same topic of uh, uh, hopefulness and uh, positivity, um, what I'm starting to notice is what I would refer to an emerging synchronicity in the opinions floating around uh, the food system. And you know, I mean, as you know, I think the the only fighting chance we have uh, to adapt in the time that is remaining is to drastically change the way we grow and process and consume food because it has the most severe impact on the on the natural world. Um, and this is not just um, this is not just emissions, but it is really the destruction of the uh, microbiome and of the really the entire biosphere and disrupting uh, hydrologic cycles and all of that is really stunning how much what we're doing here and how reckless it is considering that we lost all connection to our history and our evolution in the process of shifting into this form of agriculture. Uh, when the European settlers came over, they just completely um that which turns out it's just like a complete void of uh, what made their culture successful you know, to sit on the same piece of land for thousands of years without destroying it um but the learnings in between um did not did not make it to you know to today but um when you go when you go particularly i, I like uh I, I communicate pretty much uh, in the, on LinkedIn uh, because that's where you know, the professional people uh, are sort of gathered and uh, there's a nice community that has evolved uh, uh, in there. And you have people by and large have uh, embracing 
you know, the same opinions about what why why things go wrong, uh, what is the root cause, and what would it take to change it. And in my mind, if we if we can um, align, you know, what we believe and what we think, we can achieve amazing things. And I, I, I always come back to World War II mobilization after Pearl Harbor. The, the energy that was released by thinking alike about what it is that needs to be solved was just absolutely stunning and incredible. We're getting closer to that. Now, it's still, it's still held up, but we're getting closer to it. And in this sense, I think AI is uh, uh, and, and can be helpful in aligning uh, what we what we know so best available information if the bots are protected and the input into the bots uh, is information that everyone uh, can basically agree with uh, this is as much as we know about individual things and the ai can then pull that together and 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 carry it forward so i have found that uh, to be the to be the case pretty much with every nugget that i have sent out from the neo book which you know is sort of a freestanding topic um it it uh, it really resonates uh, it resonates in a sense that everyone can agree to this and and uh, and carry it on to the next to the next level forward so so i think the if we just keep pounding away at um aligning what we do know, it may not be perfect, it's probably uh, full of holes, but it's best available information, uh, then uh, then I think we have a fighting chance to, to secure ourselves and uh, avoid the worst impacts. Even so, I think, uh, yeah, we are, we are, in all reality, we have pushed beyond some tipping points that uh, we won't be able to screw back into place. Um, so the future will be different um, and we don't quite know how that plays out. But the the um, uh, sometimes you think you know, nothing, uh, you, you don't make an impact and there's nothing you can do, but the reality is just keep going and uh, and just you know, as you learn yourself, you know, share those learnings in, uh, in advance. Uh, I do think uh, that AI uh, at the application level, you know, not at the stratosphere where uh, it may replace humanity or whatever fears we have there, but at the application level uh, to to develop a bot that uh, knows everything there is to know about irrigation systems uh, or everything there is to know about uh, fertilizers and biotech and so on. That that kind of knowledge to uh, uh, to bring that kind of knowledge to bear to the where a farmer can simply ask a question uh, and gets the best available answer uh, customized for his particular particular field. Um, I, I see this is where AI is going to play uh, in 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 the immediate future, and this is where. Um, the uh, Sam Altman has uh, has been directing the the uh, open AI, you know, with their GPTs and and the totally decentralized uh, form of application. So I think that uh, I, I I think we we uh, we are just at the cusp of some major uh, uh, advances here.
um, a couple of days ago, NVIDIA's CEO, who appears to have adopted the mantle of Steve Jobs, although he has a leather jacket instead of a black turtleneck, but still, the look is kind of there, uh, and who is really good on stage and just really knows his stuff and presents awesomely, announced the new, their new Blackwell architecture, which isn't just a GPU, it just graphics processing unit or chip. It's a whole system of systems of systems that are packaged inside of systems that live inside of systems that can build out data centers that are have more computing power than it was possible to fathom just a little while ago. And that just increased my pondering on our cyborg future, uh, a phrase that I um, that I use gingerly. <clears throat> uh, talked about cyborgness some here. Uh, we had a couple other calls where people were like, no, I don't like the word. And I, I really, I think our future is very cyborg, by which I just mean the further melding of human capacities with software. I don't mean implants. I don't mean extropian, skeletal, whatever's, uh, there's a variety of other cyborgish visions that may or may not turn out, but I'm really actually interested in how we use software better and better to solve the problems Doug brings in front of us to avoid the separation of people from each other, like the metaverse vision seem to propose, and to steer a course that actually helps us uh, fix the planet instead of melt the planet or exhaust all of its energy. Um, and so in so doing, I've got two things that in particular that I'm working on. Uh, one of them, I have a a new friend who's Finnish but lives in Melbourne. His name is Sami Makaleinen. I'll put links in when we're done checking in. Uh, and I'll remind people that we want to use the chat less uh, during the check-in round. Uh, we will hold your chats for a second until everybody's checked in once, and then we'll just paste them all into the chat. That'll work out fine. Uh, but we, uh, on these rounds, we find that the chat is sometimes distracting. And it takes every piece of willpower I can muster to not be busy in the chat, that's for sure. Um, so Sammy and I have been talking for a while. He is uh, really, uh, really, really strong on machine learning and all these new things. And so we we thought there should be a community sort of like this, but, but purpose built for this cyborg future. Uh, we use ChatGPT to generate a whole bunch of naming options, uh, which was really fun. It's a very fun brainstorming partner. And we ended up with cyborgs with heart which was uh, the least masculine of our um, options. It was a nice balance and a nice, nice mix. So we have cyborgswithheart.com where you'll find a fledgling web website right now. Uh, we are ex we're setting up a space in Social Roots, which is Christina Bowen's platform uh, to go try to build out some conversations. Anybody's welcome to join. Let me know if you'd like to uh, be in the conversation right now. The space is not quite set up. so. Let me set up a, a barn raising party to go do that. But uh, Cyborgs with Heart is meant to do sort of both ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is what is this stuff and how do I get good at it? How do I find my way into the tools? Where is this all going? And the other end of it is um, really about cyborg ethics and friendly AI and all those other kinds of things with no notion that this community is going to come up with a better plan, but rather that it's important to know the plans that are out there and what work is being done and probably to pick a horse or two in that race and back them and to create maybe a community of practice across Gen AI coders who know where the red handle is to, to try to pull and stop projects. I don't think we can stop the whole assembly line here. I think uh, the horse is out of the barn. Sorry. I didn't throw metaphors in, but I think th this thing is racing off and uh, there's no way to hit pause, the hop the pause button for six uh, months or something like, like the letter, the open letter claimed a while ago. But rather, we really need what we haven't had for decades because now we have millions and millions and millions of programmers, coders, uh, who are being told by managers what to do and are really often doing things that they notice are morally vexing. And maybe that's a nice way of putting it. But they have no red handle. They have there's no there's no place even community to go to. Never mind laws or institution to go to to say, hey, this thing I, I'm about to do isn't illegal. It's just not good for humans. Uh, and as we enter this superpower world of Gen AI, I think we we are, we are capable of much more than before. 
and we're going to be doing things faster than before. So we need some conversation, but also community around how do you uh, send up a flare when something not good is happening and how do you slow it down, change it, unmask it, expose it. I don't know if we need whistleblower laws around this also. There might be, I don't really know, but I'm not talking about criminal activities. I'm talking about unethical activities, which is often different because a lot of things are legal that are not good for humans. We've seen. And then the other thing that I'm that I'm working on on the cyborg future is just uh, I want to give more speeches about our cyborg future. And I'm I'm not a Gen AI black belt, but I'm a cyborg with a piece of software called the brain, as you all know. And I've spent 26 years feeding one brain, and I have a lot of thoughts about the implications of that specific tool, and then a lot of thoughts about not everybody must use the brain, uh, but rather. What if everybody shared their notes better in whatever tool made sense to them? And what if we use that as a sense-making uh, world, as a sense-making space uh, to make things better so that we could discuss how capitalism is broken, how the, the regreening of the world will happen, how regenerative is uh, agriculture and regenerative everything are actually uh, big wins overall, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that's been going along. And there's some of our, our different standing calls or, or covering different aspects of, of those puzzles. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a near term, uh, I'm like, uh, I'm a near term pessimist and a long term optimist also. Uh, so I think humans are generally good. I think we're just trapped inside of a series of systems and reward mechanisms and perverse incentives and uh, uh, owned industries that make it really hard to do the right thing and make the current path we're on hard to envision uh, bending, but I think it's doable. But I think the way to do it is mostly bottom up, not top down. I think COP and all those things are, are attempts to force everybody to do big things and I hope they win, but this is only going to change if a lot of people uh, make changes, not just in their own personal lives, but recycling and changing their bulbs as uh, Al Gore so famously asked us to do back when, but rather um, more substantive change in the way things work and the things that we ask for and the things we go build. It's a longer call to action than I expected, but I am complete. Judy, you're muted. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> um, I think one of the dilemmas that I'm contemplating quite often now is sort of the duality of individualism and collectivism, both personally and in organizations in the realm of change or betterment, because it takes lots of people doing different things accomplish big change it's hard to get the alignment and it's it's hard to in some ways trust the technology that's available and so trying to discern what's real and right and fact-based and then how to move with that fact-based content to some level of impact you know, one on one is one level, one on a team is another, one in an organization like a company is another, and getting to global takes all of the above. And there doesn't seem to be a systematic contemplation of that process anywhere that I've looked. Um, now, I, I confess I'm not a scholar in that re regard, so I might have missed things, but it concerns me because. Trust is at the root of all of it. And I think trust is at an all time low. People don't trust systems. You don't agree, Jerry, okay. Um, maybe it's just my doubt at this moment in terms of the effectiveness of any action that is undertaken. Um, and contemplating what the personal role is that I could possibly commit to doing 
and how that could have a positive cascade effect in some way is my major dilemma right now. And it's causing me to reflect on which groups I participate in, how many Zoom calls I have, whether or not they're well organized even, because some are very badly organized. Um, it's better than trying to do a phone conference, um, but you don't get the same energy as being with people in reality too. So I'm sorry that that's not very informative, but it's kind of where I'm at today. <laughs> John, we're not hearing you. Your mute is off on Zoom, but we're not getting any audio. <clears throat> Change your Zoom mic settings to, nope, not yet. I pulled out my headset. Yes. Can you, yeah. Now you're back. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'll riff off of that because it touches right to where I am. Um, I, I live in that uh, systematic contemplation across levels. Um, when I started to support, uh, her name was Tree Bresson then, she goes by Kavana Tree Bresson now, but uh, she was the person who thought up the group works deck, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, and it is a pattern language of group process. I used the pattern language term lightly. I, I had a conversation with Ward that helped me realize there's a big difference between patterns and having a pattern language, but we did do some effort uh, uh, to knit them together, you know, into something uh, greater than the sum of its parts, which takes me to one of Tom Atley's quotes, which is starting from that, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and the part is greater than its role in the whole. The latter part for is kind of a load, uh, you know, guide star for me, you know, in thinking about collectivizing and talking about collective. Oh, we need more in this context. We need more collectivizing. One of the fears you often get from people is they'll be erased as an individual. So if you include in the same whole that the part is greater than its role in the whole, you will be acknowledged as an individual separate from what you do for or how you fit in the group, et cetera that speaks to that and reminds those of us who might rush to the collectivist side, that, oh, oh, right, we have to consider the individuals as individuals also. Um, so when that, when that group work stack, I was like, oh, all these, so many of these patterns apply across levels from the smallest to the largest. Let's just let it be that. And trees like, no, oh, I'd really like to stick to groups pretty much, you know, but many of the patterns do apply to the individuals and organizations and larger you know, movements. Um, but yeah, so maybe I don't know how systematic I am, but I'm aware across the level. And I think about the things I do in that context. And I only feel fully alive to the extent I'm doing things that apply in some way across, you know, from the very personal and interpersonal, I need to do more of the personal uh, than I do. Uh, uh, but also at itch, you know, the group, the household, I live in a intentional community. Um, but yeah, I the transcending the duality of individual collective, you know, and to see it all the way multi-scalar up, you know, is one of the great uh, challenges to me or, you know, things to get out there as a given for more people. Um, and then I just wanted to, uh, 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 for me, hope is, uh, it, it, well, trust is intrinsically for me, part of a word cluster of like trust, hope, faith, grace, wonder, and that explicitly includes science fiction and sense of wonder. So like even atheists have this concept, right? Many atheist science fiction fans will still happily talk about sense of wonder, this awe, you know, there's all these words. Um, and, 
of course, they can fill many different grammatical and philosophical roles, many very different ones, an emotion, something else altogether. Uh, Mariam Kaba has been popularizing, uh, she got it from a, a nun, I believe, uh, hope as a discipline. Um, and she's one of my absolute top favorite activists right now, Mariam Kaba. Uh, in abolition and and just in general, if you really follow what she's doing, um, um, and uh, yeah, that's just a, 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 a thank you. This it's great to have a reminder to check in and and uh, kind of have felt prompted to go to the good things because I'm in actually personally a very challenged space right now, check in wise. I've been a little more engaged the last few months and uh, I can feel the first hints of like, oh, I've taken on too much, not not good at letting go of anything, uh, 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 still not doing enough to attend to my own uh, body, my own self. And um, um, yeah, so, I, so and if anybody wants to talk about that aspect of things, I have an unwritten thing, but very well worked out on mutual support which is not tied to any particular modality. Anybody who knows me knows I'm deep into nonviolent communication, but after many years uh, uh, hanging out in scenes where that was not a thing so much and having my two consistent uh, weekly support people neither have a deep background in it at all, but finding ways to, uh, so, so I sort of, sort of de-lingoed my NVC, if you will, uh, pretty thoroughly. Um, and, uh, for me, there was always a distinction between practice groups and support groups. Practice groups, a little emphasis, and this is not just NBC, any practice, any anything. Is the emphasis on learning or is the emphasis on supporting each other? You can do both. But when you come to those moments where you're like, oh, we could, I could interrupt to make a learning point or I could be silent and let this person work through what they're working through. And so you'll lean a little bit one way or the other if it if you understand it primarily as a practice group a learning group or as a support group you're there for each other and that is the priority um yeah so if anybody wants to reach out and talk about mutual support uh, uh that would be lovely thank you all this is um, a nice format Um, Kevin, it feels like you checked in already earlier and we're not conversing until we've all checked in or do you want to have something else? I just have something to add to my reflection on the guy I talked about. From earlier? Okay, so we'll we'll just pretend you hit pause earlier. So that's great. Step in whenever you want. Yeah, well, it's just that I realized he's comforted by collapse and and hope breaks him out of this ceramic he has the world in that and takes him, makes him think there's a window. And it troubles him, but he's comforted by being in a windowless world. And that's just, I think that's, that he finds it comforting. Like, oh, it's all going to fall apart. I'll act that way. Personal health and puts it all on Facebook. Um, also, your connection. Does really your... Good things. And it's just that he's comforted by collapse, you know. Giving up hope is a comforting position. That that was all I had to say. Thanks, Kevin. Your connection is also sort of janky. So in this case, it 
cut out for a while and then quickly caught up a bit. So it, it was a little messy, but your connections have been a little dicey. Let me let me let me put on my headset and just because I just have one short thing to say. Um, it's just that my friend is comforted by collapse and having the possibility of hope uh, disturbs him. And that's it. I'd like to thank the Plex uh, readers and and especially the Plex contributors. Um, uh, it, I I put a lot of energy into building the Plex, but um, but it's really the you know the people write writing the the pieces that make it. Um, this this issue was really good. I thought um, I could check in about a, a bunch of things. Um, uh, Jensen Huang's uh, keynote seemed like a watershed event. One of those things that happens that seems like it's kind of important at the time, and but it's kind of like also this, the same size as other things in the world. So maybe it's not that important, but it feels like we'll we'll look back in you know ten years and it goes. This is kind of the inflection point. And I I posted in a couple places. You know, here's a you know, here's a screenshot. Here's the here's one place you can start in that video and that really long video and kind of get an overview of it, and then at least know what you're listening for as you listen through the whole thing. Because taken all together is kind of a, I mean, it's it's got some flash and production value, but it's it's a pretty boring technical thing <laughs> to get through. Um, but wrapped in that boring technical stuff is kind of literally a mind blowing uh, sense of scale uh, and scope that, um, you know, that is uh, kind of terrifying for, for a lot of us uh, and kind of like uh, super hopeful and, and like a second coming, uh, at least the second coming of the industrial revolution for others of us. So it's quite a thing to, to see that and, and to kind of know that it's bubbling along in the background of, of our world and see a little, I've seen multiple news articles feeding off of that, that one keynote where it was like, you know, Jensen Huang talks about Blackwell, the new compute, you know, thing, or it talks about robots, the new, you know, or it talks about whatever, you know, there's like a bunch of different stories that you can kind of roll out of that. And if you're doing a news article, you can only roll one of those stories. You can't roll the whole thing because it's just too big. It's fascinating to watch. The, I, I wanted to, to bring the scope down and instead of talking about a lot of different things, talk about one little vignette that, that warmed my heart a lot uh, this morning. Um, one of the things I, I can do in my life uh, is participate in open source. Um, and it's a joy and a wonder to have open source work when it works. And I don't mean like, taking the fruits of open source and using it, um, which is also a joy and a wonder. But when you, when you can collaborate with somebody in open source, it's, it's a joy and a wonder. So it is that I have this small but incredibly beautiful little piece of open source code that is really important to me. Um, it's, a, it's a set of buttons that uh, loads itself into the ChatGPT uh, interface. And you can click on it, and you can export all your conversations uh, with ChatGPT in a nice format that's actually the same format that Massive Wiki and Obsidian use. So um, the code is really well written. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, the, the maintainers had to like fiddle around a little bit when ChatGPT changes the web page. He's had to fiddle it around a little bit to make sure it continues to work. So when I first found it, it was like, well, thank God. I, I can do it right now and at least export all the conversations I've had. I don't know if this thing is going to continue to work. So I've been building up trust over time with it. And um, I, I feel pretty like I, I trust it now, which is nice. Um, I have to say, if you it, when we poke around and find the link to this thing, um, it requires two levels of trusting somebody that you don't know uh, with some of your sensitive information. So. It's not something um, 
a, a civilian can pick up easily and, and be sure that it's not doing something bad. Um, so I'm sure it's not doing something bad, but I can't convey that to somebody else um, in a way that makes it so that you should just use it. So let's talk more about it. Anyway, so it was uh, that in January, um, uh, this is an open source project. So unbeknownst to me, somebody in January said, hey, uh, ChatGPT has this new feature and, and we should support it. Or this, it would be really nice if this little tool supported it. And so the maintainer, you know, like cogitated and said, that's a really good idea. And so it was that he put a new button on one of the, the main things that I use, right? And so I didn't understand what this new button was. The, it's, it's the word archive, which can mean a lot of different things. It means one particular thing, but it could mean a lot of different things. And I don't want to blow up all of my chat conversation history with, with ChatGPT by pressing this button and have it do something that, that you know, made sense to the person who named the button, but wasn't what I was expecting. So classic software thing is like, well, I'll go look for the documentation for archive and what this means. And I found none. So because I'm an open source developer, I was able to go into the code and find it and then find a link back to the, the place where somebody said, there, I, there's an enhancement that I would like. Well, we'll let's call it archive. And so I hold, found the whole conversation. So now I'm enlightened and I can use the archive button without fear um, or at least knowing, you know, knowing what to expect. Except that I know me um, in three months from now, I'm not gonna remember what the archive button means anymore. <laughs> so what do I do with that information? You know, it's like, okay, well, I have this little nugget of information. I could put it on my personal wiki and find it again in three months. That's pretty good. Even better, I can glue it onto the, the software product itself. So the way to do that is to um, make a copy of the software product. This is classic open source stuff. Make a copy of it, it's called a fork. Make the changes. So what I did is I hacked into the, the uh, instruction file. I hacked the section in that explained you know, the whole, actually not just that button, but everything around that button. Here's all the things in this little part of the screen that you need to know about. And I didn't say it this way, but, and oh, by the way, here's what the archive button does. So that was my main point was just explaining the archive button. But to do that, I had to explain the whole section of the screen. And to do that, I had to go to the instructions for this thing and hack it in. So this is a standard thing to do in open source. It's a weird thing to do in the real world, but it's a standard thing. Uh, this maintainer happens to be a guy in Taiwan uh, whose native language is, is Chinese. He's also, it, se it seems to be very fluent in English. So he's at least bilingual, which is cool. Um, uh, the, the instructions have been translated into Korean and Turkish and, and some of the language that I didn't want to tackle my, my little documentation thing in those languages. So I at least said, you know, in my contribution back to his open source project, I said, I wrote this, I didn't translate it into these languages. And I know that somebody else can, you know, pick up and now translate my section. Um, so the way it works with open source is I don't know this person. He doesn't know me, but I can still collaborate like a hundred to a hundred percent depth, everything in the product I can touch and I can change, but I don't change his copy of it. I change my copy of it. And then I, I issue a pull request that's called him and say, um, you know, dear, dear, wonderful sir, who's made this awesome product that I use a lot. Here's a, a humble contribution. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've added documentation. So the cool thing about open source projects is all of that flowery language I just did, I left out. I didn't explain any of that because he's an open source developer. I'm an open source developer. You can just assume that all of that flowery language around the pull request is just part of what I'm doing. Um, so I, I press the send button. I don't know this guy from Adam. I don't know what he's going to do with it. Um, maybe he's going to think my thing is stupid. Maybe it's it's interrupts his ar architectural flow. Maybe he doesn't understand English as well as I thought he did. Whatever, right? I have no idea. So that was two days ago. I pushed the button and then I, I closed my windows and like moved on. At least I have it written down someplace on my computer. So it was this morning that um, I got a message back uh, from this guy. He said, wow, thanks so much. 
Um, and I'm like, that's really cool. He liked it. He's going to, um, you know, merge it into the, the main code. That's wonderful. And then even better was instead of merging it into his code, he made a offer back. Here's a better way to word this one sentence. And this was the sentence, I, one, part, one of the sentences I writ, wrote when it was late at night and it was a clumsy sentence and I hated it, but, <laughs> but it worked. And he has this beautiful little like clean, much more clean sentence, you know, added to my thing. So the, what I, I know this is a lot of detail, but I don't know this person. We're collaborating. We're collaborating at full depth. Um, I don't need to know him anymore. He doesn't need to know me anymore. It's all about the work that we did together. And we've just improved the small but very important part of my world, right? In his world and everybody uses this, this, little, this little product. So that's my vignette for today. Um, open source sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, but when it works and I don't need to know somebody even to collaborate, it, it's just like, it's just super sweet. So thanks for listening. Hi, hey, neighbors. Um, so I wrote a bunch of stuff down, but I think my check-in is going to be about check-ins. Um, so the gentleman who went before Pete, whose name is I will affectionately call Slow. <laughs> um, so one of the things you articulated um, through your you were thanking us for, for this face. And what I noticed is something that I notice a lot of times is that talking about where you are is incredibly valuable. A, because we never do it. Nobody really like gives you the, the a window to say, well, here's here's where I am, especially in a kind of wandering sort of way. I don't really know. And I'm not also saying, oh, I'm fine. How are you? It's actually, how are you? And where we all just listen, because typically in these situations, people are going to jump in and comment about the first thing you say, which then doesn't allow you to explore where things are. And then I want to combine that with Judy's comment that, sorry, that's not very informative, but that's where I am. Um, so I learned something a couple of years ago from the world of information science in that the amount of surprise is the amount of information. And it's been a fascinating idea to me. So if something is not surprising to you, then you already know it. And if you didn't already know it, it's surprising, which is that's where the information is. And what I notice is that when we are giving our check-ins, a lot of the time we surprise ourselves with something we didn't already know or hadn't articulated yet. And so I guess, what does no mean? But it's that we've wandered to something that 
that was inside of us that we didn't realize yet. And, you know, to, you know, Judy saying, oh, well, I guess that's kind of where I am right now. You know, I don't have a resolution to that. And just saying that is valuable. Um, so anyway, that's a, it's a little check-in about check-ins, which I think this environment is kind of rare for me every week. So. So I will add a bit of a vignette. Uh, I just got back from six months in uh, Malaysia, in Borneo, actually, working on the edge of the jungle with a group of farmers. And the group that I'm working with would like to get these farmers to shift out of palm oil into uh, sustainable vegetables. And the farmers say, look, we're earning enough money with the palm oil. We're not going to stop, even though we know it's destroying the land and it's a short-term gain, maybe five years more. Uh, when that fails, then we'll up, be up to considering an alternative. That struck me as the way most people are actually thinking. Let me keep doing what I'm doing so long as it's working, because to change would be to disrupt everything. And I'm not there yet. So I found it quite amazing how clear things seemed out there uh, with the orangutans.
John, we're not hearing you if you're talking to us. Um, just wanted to unpause long enough to appreciate Scott's comments and to say that mutual support, as I like to practice it, uh, begins with a brief check-in from each person, uh, leaving enough time for there to be a sense of plenty, a sense of enoughness, you know, circling back around either to something that was said or uh, where continuing with, you know, wherever it goes for someone. Um, but I'll, 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 somebody did reach out, so maybe that will prompt me to write up uh, more of it and bring it to the group. Thank you all again. Yeah, already checked in. There are a couple who haven't checked in, Jerry, but... Uh, yes, I'm waiting. For, I'm actually trying to wait for them. So okay. if you've already spoken, I'll ask if you, that you're not until... I think it's Doug B., Eric, and Bill. And if you'd like to pass, just let us know in the chat or just they pass or whatever. But there's still a couple of people who have not checked in. And Carl. Oh, and Carl, that's right. Sorry. I'm actually going to pass on checking in, but just um, I'm finding this session extremely powerful and different than all other sessions. And there, the level of connection and the level of um, the into me see intimacy um is terrific and i'm just would like to express my gratitude to everyone who shared what they've shared where they've shared from um and um it it very much warms my heart and is at the center of what i live for so thank you And, and I can't resist since, since the pause is still there. Um, I saw this cartoon with Doug C's share um, of, of two, two, um, two of the, what were the, um, did you mention orangutans or bamboo, uh, baboons, um, you know, sitting in a tree looking out over the palm plantation and one turns to the other and says, palm oil, palm oil, palm oil. What's wrong with bananas? <laughs> and you said out there with them. And the truth is they're out there with you. <laughs> so. And I think at this point, Carl, you've got the floor if you'd like it, but I can't see you, so I don't know if you're actually listening. Uh, 
I'm going to assume Carl is not attending to the Zoom right this second and uh, free the hounds, so to speak. Um, I I was distracted a bit because there were a lot of people chatting and I was busy trying to think of, should I be a stronger list mom or should we just dump the rule and let people chat like crazy during check-in round? I don't know. I'm open to suggestions, but I don't want to be really strict because <clears throat> I could just, I unfortunately as, as moderator can't find a way to turn the chat off selectively during the call. I, that would be an interesting feature as well. Um, briefly before I go to Gil for whatever you're about to say, uh, Doug B, your comment was actually funny and ironic because it is orangutans. They're the ones who need the palm forests. And um, <clears throat> what's wrong with bananas is that uh, the countries that went for bananas got turned into banana republics and got owned, including their presidents were deposed and killed in order to protect uh, you know, the banana industry, which was a now known as Chiquita brands. That was a United Fruit. Uh, there is a very good Neruda poem called United Fruit, which I encourage you reading. It's actually pretty brilliant about that whole history. That's the problem with becoming a banana republic. And every time I pass a Banana Republic store, I get a little twinge of, of, of earthly regret for those reasons. Gil, go ahead. Um, so much to comment on, which I won't, but just on the list mom thing, be list mom, be gentle, uh, know that it takes a while for behavior to change, for new habits to kind of sink in. So we're still all in the old respond, respond game. And it'll it'll settle. It'll take some time. Uh, but there's something very valuable about having a quieter conversation. This is not a new behavior, Gil. We've been doing no chat during um, Zoom, during check-ins for a long time. For some this months, absolutely not a new behavior. For some months, not for some years. Okay. Well, We've been it was into 2023, so it spans well, we, two years. Well, okay. So my my experience of it is that it's a change from what it used to be. It used to be, you know, chat all the time. And now it's chat some of the time or less of the time in some of the calls. And for me, that's new. And it's a habit that I have to consciously work to break. And it takes time to move habits. That's all I'm saying. So thanks, mom. Love it. Um, Klaus, then Pete. Yeah, I wanted to uh, to respond to what Doug was saying about the, his experience with these farmers, because we have a very similar scenario here in the U.S. and actually elsewhere, everywhere. Um, farmers, by and large, know that they are messing up their soil and and that they are uh, losing their legacy, you know, for future generations uh, in the way they farm and they see what's going on around them. But you can't ask a farmer to put at risk his livelihood and do what everyone thinks they should be doing, but in the process, no one wants to pay for it. So the the what what we're working on is to provide farmers with access to markets that pay premiums for differentiated crops that have uh, a higher value for the soil, you know, that regenerate the soil. And that is a huge challenge you know, because the markets have been so um, messed up. Uh, so, for example, when you, you know, we're working with this group of farmers in the Palouse, their crane cores, uh, if they come up with a perennial crane or a differentiated type of crane that comes out of a more organic soil, they simply can't get milling uh, access, access to a flour mill, that would that would isolate you know their relatively smaller crop and then process that into into uh, you know, a organic flour or premium flour. Um, that capacity is simply is simply uh, 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 not there. This this group of farmers, uh, the their flour mill they were working with in Pendleton burned down. And they went out of business for three months. They could not. It took them three months to re to reestablish access to flour mills, so they could maintain their brand, which is called Shepherd's Cranes. So the 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 effort you know, of the regenerative uh, movement really has to be to assist farmers to gain access to markets and in the process establish. Uh, a gap analysis of what is missing. So in the meat markets, for example, it's access to slaughterhouse facilities. 
right? You go to Europe, every little town has a has a butcher. You know, they have small farmers can bring in one cow, you know, uh, and 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 turn that into into revenue. Uh, that simply doesn't exist here in the U.S. and in other places. So it's this um, uh, this this idea, you know, that uh, to demand, you know, from farmers to do things that are not in their economic interest is just is just not realistic. And I think if these farmers, uh, Doc, that you were working with, uh, had been provided with a vision of how uh, they can change you know into into a different type of uh, of growing practice or change out their crops and make more money or at least make uh, uh, have no economic losses but maintain their livelihood uh, chances are they would have done it The problem for the farmers is that alternative markets would pay out so much less than the palm oil. So we've been talking with them about uh, with climate change, it, the time will come when supply chains of food coming into the communities will fail and they need an alternative. And they understand that argument, but they're saying so long as the cash is coming in from palm oil, that's where we're staying. Funny, um, I have a thought in my brain that's a big assertion, but I haven't really fact checked it. But it's like that most famines are economic; they're not just a disaster strikes. It's like the Bengal famine. There's plenty of rice in the ports. Uh, the British won't release it because they need money to get any. They need to get paid in money, and Indians don't have money. There's just a silver scarcity. There's a coin scarcity. There's a huge money crisis. India's in trouble, mm. and so millions of people starve to death because of that it's economic and and plenty of others and it seems like these things aren't about convincing people to do otherwise it's about restructuring the system or changing the reward mechanisms or whatever else uh, as we go sorry i missed doug b's departure um but if we could puzzle together clever ways of shifting the economics for the people who are doing things we'd rather they not do which I know that some people are trying to do, but if we did more of that, maybe that would help. Pete? For me, this is like, a, this is like a, a critical kind of tipping point. Um, uh, I actually got a little bit of a pain in my chest, Jerry, and, and it's not nothing in relationship to actually what happened, but when you said millions of people died because the British couldn't be bothered to unload the ships, you know, that's like, I, that's I like unspeakably, you know, if I started thinking about that, I could just go into a funk for a long time. There, there and, are four, 4 million deaths from that. And Churchill is one of the guilty people here. Yeah. It's evil beyond, evil beyond my comprehension of its comprehension. And yet, <laughs> so the, the, the point I, I want to make here is that <clears throat> at human scale, like literally, I, you know, it's evil and suffering and, and pain beyond even my comp comprehension of thinking about comprehending it, you know, it's like massive. We live in a world where we have what I've been calling hyperscale social systems or something like that, hyperscale structures. In the, if you put yourself in the place of the, the golems or whatever we've called them, the giants, the, the grunches of giants, it's like, yeah, a couple million Indians died, whatever, no big deal. We're, we're balancing, you know, economic trade, blah, blah, blah. And that's the important thing. It's like, so, you know, if you look at the whole world's economic system as one body or something like that, it's kind of like, ow, I stubbed my toe rather than having 4 million people die, right? Horrible, like, uncomprehendingly bad things. 
So for, for me, that's the, when it's, it's super easy for us to say there should be a way or we should do, or we should just change the way that we think or ask people to be better people or appeal to their humanity or whatever. The, the root problem is that we've got these monster systems, which are unimaginably bigger than an individual person or unimaginably bigger than all the people that you've ever met in your life or unimaginably bigger than all the places that you've ever been and all the people that you've ever seen and all of those people. The systems that we're talking about are still bigger than that. And I, I know we sometimes talk about that scale and scope and how to change things. And I love publishing Kevin's stories about changing the world uh, in his part of the world. It's amazing and inspirational and I love it. But the when we're talking about what we can do, you need to be thinking not at you know human scale level or you know like city scale scale level. Or I mean you do actually that's to Klaus's point. You have to start where you are with the, the soil that you've got and the, you know, and the food that you're growing and the, the food that you can grow here and the food that you can distribute to the people who need it. You need to start there. But the problem that we've got is those hyper, hyper, hyper scale systems, which are, which, which make even Jensen Huang's vision of the future seem really small, right? All the stuff that he talked about all at scale is still really small compared to the massive systems who we live inside of and have gotten psychotic. Um, and so that psychosis of those massive systems is, is a, the root cause or the root problem or the, the thing that we have to figure out how to puncture and deflate. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I just uh, uh, got triggered by um, Bill's comment uh, about Sam Altman's vision, open AI vision versus uh, the, what is seems to be happening. What I see happening right now, and I also see this confirmed with my son, who is working, you know, in an AI at the Triffin company, uh, Sam Sarah. Um, the, the, the they they are developing actually a ChatGPT enterprise version. Um, so what they do is, and this is this is my my vision also for for what we're doing with with agriculture is to develop a chatbot that is sort of the the master uh, uh, unit, and then from there you develop bots that are highly specialized for uh, uh, call it a subroutine, whatever. So, so in their case, for example, the Sam Sarah, they're developing a chatbot for for the engineering department, you know, for uh, customers who like American Airlines who uh, have very specific issues with moving, with managing an airport, and what do they need to know to optimize this so they were able to reduce the the cost of American Airlines at the Denver airport by fifteen percent simply by anticipating where equipment needs to be and how staff needs to be deployed and so on. So in in the farming community, you know, there are the, the last newsletter that uh, Pete just uh, uh, published, I asked the AI to explain how it could help agriculture uh, to, to shift into regenerative practices. And it basically laid out a blueprint of what kind of specialists we would have to bring to the industry in terms of you know, AI, best available information uh, to assist very specific processes like demand analysis, demand forecasting by crop type, you know, by volume and so on. And that's, that's where I see AI uh, uh, going to make a, a big difference is at the ground level, you know, at the implementation level, assisting uh, engineers, assisting farmers, assisting uh, uh, in the actual work process. You don't need manuals anymore. You know, the AI has that knowledge. You just ask it the question, it will provide you with what you need to know at the exact paragraph with a diagram on it. So so I, I think that the power that uh, 
open AI will bring to the table is its decentralization into the smallest possible application. We have reached the end of our call time. We'll go, we'll spill over a little bit and I'm hoping Ken can stay with us and has a poem for us, but let's go Pete and Gil. Apologies. And Carl had a Is hectic morning and Ken, if you want to, uh, uh, Carl, if you want to step in and um, talk about those things, that'd be great too. So go ahead, Pete, sorry. Sorry, it was a, it was a stuck hand, apologies. No. Oh. Well, there we go, uh, Gil. So I'll pick up from Pete on the psychosis of the bigger systems. Yeah, and yet somehow bigger systems have changed in human history. So I know from that that it's not impossible for it to happen, although I don't have any idea how it happens. Um, it takes me back to, um, to the thread from Doug C. earlier on, and it seems that it's really different. It's very easy to say to, say to somebody, you should change. It's really different to say to somebody, you should change or you might want to consider changing. Here's how I can help you. Uh, world of difference. One of the reasons The Great Transformation by Carl Polanyi is one of my favorite books is that he's talking about the shift into the early industrial revolution. And he talks about what got shredded from how we lived before and how it changed. He also talks about what people call the double movement, but there was an attempt to protect people from the changes that failed. There's a whole bunch of things that happened in the meantime that where we end up in what I would say is the present, some big piece of the present flavor of capitalism that we that we uh, take for granted today. And, and I'm interested in how did we forget the old ways of, of staying alive, which, which uh, Weber and, uh, and when uh, when grow and graber uh, elaborate in the dawn of everything uh, that's why that book is really important to me is that that they're saying look 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 there were this wide variety of ways that communities stayed alive they were really clever and inventive um and we think that they weren't we think la life was nasty brutish and short and that's it somehow it's really weird pearl off to you yeah in addition to the i triple s conference um well, in general and stuff, with so much stuff going on in D.C., I mean, if people let me know if you're ever going to be in D.C. And, uh, I think that's one of the things going forward is when people do travel, we need to really maximize the effectiveness. And so, if, you know, what's and meeting meeting people in person and stuff, there's still no substitute for that. Um, I still, I met Doug Breitbart at a, um, Howard Rangel conference or co course back in 2013, and we've never met in per <laughs> person. I mean, we work closely on things, usually a couple, a few hours a week, and we've never met. So, um, so that that's intriguing. And then um, with some presentations I made, with um, some of you know, Doug Engelbart's been a major um, influence on me in this. Carnegie Foundation is really the one who took his ideas about network improvement communities and run with it. There's 14 dissertations that have network improvement communities in the title and stuff. So that's going to be where where my dissertation is when I get as I start getting back into it. Got to decide by next week or by the end of the month if I'm going to start try to start in the summer or wait till the fall, but I got to get back to it this year. So well, that's my check in then. Thank you, Carl. Glad you're seeing people like humans in the flesh. Good. Um, Kevin, then Ken. Uh, you're muted. I'm trying to get there. Yeah, just briefly, we're teaching this uh, ACT local school. My daughter and I are at the Asheville Poverty Initiative. And we did it with a hybrid Zoom yesterday and we realized we're not going to do that. There are a lot of people who want to pay us to be on Zoom and we're just not going to do it. We're acting local, so we're going to be talking to people who show up and we'll make an experience and, and it won't be good. Uh, it will be uh, act local for the people in the room who want to do, you know, uh, workforce housing and the food, you know, the things people care about. We know what people care about. We have some experts. 
And we, it, we, we think that a hybrid, a Zoom experience obviously works, this works. Mm -hmm. But a hybrid experience doesn't really work if you want to do things locally. So we're just saying no, no. We'll put it up on YouTube and all these places you put things. You know, there, there's a young person who does, you know, TikTok and those sorts of things and all that kind of thing that I don't know what to do with. And <clears throat> she's much more literate on Instagram and all that stuff. You know, uh, young people are leading it who know how to do all that kind of stuff. But we're just going to be in the room. So it's, it's, I think it's a really interesting design decision. I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, Kevin, I'm curious. I assume that the hybrid thing doesn't work because you can't really address the people online well and it doesn't work. Is there a way you could record even just audio what the meeting is and make that available later with Yeah, we're going to record it. Yeah, we're going to we're going to we're going to put it up on YouTube, but cool. we want the people's attention to be on the people in the room. Really? This, these are these are people in this community who want to do things about the problems they care about. We're always getting, you know, there's already always a group of people who are already working on this problem. And I thought I was going to bring in national experts to zoom in, and they said, "No, this is this is the local experience. Let's do that." And so I said, "Well, okay." But it was distracting. We had to pass around a microphone so that the people on Zoom who could hear us mm -hmm. all, where that when we were paying attention to that more than the people in the room, than we should. And so it's just you know, my daughter thought it, and I'm I'm uh, so. I'm on board. I, I think it's, 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 it feels weird to not, not have, I mean, we don't have it recorded, right? There'll be somebody with a camera and a, you know, putting it up online, but, but it will be just for the people in the room. And I just haven't done that in years. <laughs> we love that. So, so okay. that's, that's kind of funny. Carl, did you want to jump back in? Before we go to a phone? Currently not. Uh, now I have to get ready for. Oh, my there we one. go. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead, Ken. So I almost I, I when you mentioned Naruta, I went out and grabbed United Food Company, which I haven't read for a while, but I decided I didn't want to read that because it's it's a downer poem and I, it's spring and it I want I want to do something springy. So and I'm going to go to started with gratitude then hope. So yeah. So I'm going to go to Mary Oliver. Um, it's a poem called The Turtle. The turtle breaks from the blue-black skin of the water, dragging her shell with its musky, mossy scoots across the shallows and through the rushes and over the mudflats to the uprise, to the yellow sand, to dig with her ungainly feet a nest and hunker there, spewing her white eggs down into the darkness. And you think of her patience, her fortitude, her determination to complete what she was born to do. And then you realize a greater thing. She doesn't consider what she was born to do. She's only filled with an old blind wish. It isn't even hers, but came to her in the rain or the soft wind, which is a gate through which her life keeps walking. She can't see herself apart from the rest of the world or the world from which she must do every spring, what she must do every spring, crawling up the high hill, luminous under the sand that has packed against her skin. She doesn't dream. She knows. She is a part of the pond she lives in. The tall trees are her children. The birds that swim above her are tied to her by an unbreakable string. Love that. Thank you. Um, thank you all. It's delightful. Really appreciate your being here. Uh, good to see you. Go leg your eggs, everybody. That's right. And let's be careful out there. Okay, Sarge. Thanks. <laughs>